Hello everyone and welcome to today's interview with uh, ARRA favourite Nalini Singh over in Auckland um, for Romantic Rendezvous Lockdown. Uh, today I'll be talking with Nalini about her three new books or coming up and you know the series that she's written, what's next for her and what she's maybe been doing in lockdown other than writing. So welcome <laughs> Nalini and thank you so much for finding time to be with us. Oh it's great to be here, thank you for inviting me. I always love RA events and if we can't do it in person, then this online event is just as good. I think so too. Alrighty, so I have lots of questions. The first one is, well, we'll discuss each of your recent or upcoming novels a little later. I wanted to talk generally first and acknowledge the very large number of books you've written in, in what seems like a really short time. Um, has it been a wild ride for you having that many books in circulation? Um, well, for me, it doesn't feel like it's been a short time, you know, because I spend months with every book. So by the time it goes out, I feel like I've probably read it about 200 times. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's, it's just built slowly. When I started my very first year, I only had one book out. And so it felt like so long. And now sometimes I look back at my backlist and I can't believe it that it's grown to, you know, 40 plus books. Um, it's been a great ride, I'll say, yeah. Um, so what draws you to writing series? Because a lot of your books are series or even the, you know, the novels and the novellas are connected in some way. I love following families and not necessarily, you know, blood families. So, um, families of every kind, people who are related and families that we create as we go through life. And in paranormal worlds, you know, the families that come out of packs or in my Guild Hunter series, um, there's the Guild Hunters who are a family and then there's the Seven, there's all these families. And I really love that. I love getting to know people and then following their journey from book to book. So it's not just one story. For example, uh, you know, Lucas and Sasha, the very first Sci Changeling book. If we, if I just left them at the end of that book, we wouldn't know how their life has developed to this point. We wouldn't know that, um, you know, that they, they, their family has grown. We wouldn't know how each of them has settled into their power as Alpha and as a cardinal empath. So, all of these stories, they can't be told within simply one book. So it's two things. It's that whole family thing and friendships and following them through years and, uh, and just, yeah, getting to go back and see everyone's lives. I'm incredibly nosy, you know, so I want to know everything about all the characters all the time. And it's also on a story, uh, just on a purely story point, I tell these great big overarching stories a lot of the time and so I need multiple books for the threads to come unravel and yeah for the story to be told. Lucky for us. Um, does world building because you do build incredible worlds does it come easily to you or is it still hard work? I am more of an instinctive writer so I don't sit down and sort of plot out my whole world. So I suppose in a sense you could say it comes easily in that I just sit down and I write and the world grows as I write. But what is difficult is keeping track of everything. So that does take, you know, that does take taking notes and keeping track and going back over previous books over and over again. So I do reread my work, uh, not just to get information, but just to reread the work. But, um, for me, continuity is the hardest part. Uh, when you build a world that's so big, it's so sprawling, there's so many aspects to it. Um, you know, it's easy sometimes to think, oh, yep, that was how it was. And then except two books ago, I changed something. So it's constantly keeping myself updated with my world. Um, but not in terms of the big stuff. I mean, the world is so vivid, the big stuff I'm always going to remember. It's just these tiny little details occasionally that's like, oh, what did I say about that? I don't know, seven books ago. <laughs> um, so yeah, but the, the initial world building, that's, 
that's so free. There's no rules at that point. You know, I'm just creating a world and it can be whatever I want it to be. So yeah, there's a, there's that freedom at the start. And then as I go along, um, the continuity means it becomes harder, but at the same time, it's, it's good to have a challenge as a writer because it means I can't have easy answers for things because I have to take into account what I said previously. I get it. Now, our first reader question for you comes from Charlotte Ann. I would love to know about your writing routine, considering how prolific you are. Are you more of a morning or an afternoon person? And how many words do you try and write every day? It really depends on which, uh, Okay, so I'll take the first question first, the morning or the afternoon person. I used to be like a night owl, like complete, like I would write at two o'clock in the morning. Um, like my brain would start going at after dinner and then I would just power on through the night time. But I've tried to sort of retrain my brain <laughs> because I, at one point for some reason, I can't remember, now, I think it was jet lag. I think jet lag had me waking up at like five o'clock in the morning and then I was like what should I do and I started writing and I realized I really love those early morning hours when the world is quiet and I can write so I've been trying to retrain myself to to actually get up in the morning and do that early morning writing and um it's worked sometimes and sometimes not <laughs> but I don't mm, I think still my my natural tendency is towards to go towards the end of the day. But if I can get myself going in the morning, I do actually produce good work, I think. So I have a feeling that our bodies can be retrained. You know, we think it can be only one way. And the, and the thing is, when I, before I became a full-time writer, I used to write whenever I could find the time. So it's not like I didn't have the ability, you know, to write in the middle of the day. I used to write in my lunch hour at some points. So yeah, um, at the moment, what I usually do, how it works out is um, because most of my editors and my agent are overseas, I have to check emails in the morning in order to catch them at the office before they leave, you know. So uh, the first thing I do in the morning is usually do a quick check of emails and that's just you know work emails so not emails from friends or non-urgent emails just all the urgent stuff and then a quick update of social media and then I get into writing so if I'm doing a first draft I try to do about 5,000 words a day and that's usually when I don't have other things on the plate so for example currently I've got copy edits that need to be turned around and I'm editing a project. So normally I would edit about 25 pages a day, but because I've got the copy edits as well, I've brought that down to 10 pages. And then I do the copy, so I'm doing those pages in the morning, and then in the, after lunch, I'll do the um, copy edits. So there has to be a juggle. I think um, I didn't realize this when I, before I was published, you know, you just write the book. But after you're published, you know, copy edits come in, proofs come in, um, maybe someone needs you to answer some questions about uh, a promotion thing. So there's all these things that have to be balanced. Yeah. And um, what was the second part of the question? I've completely forgotten. I'm not, you covered it. How many words do you Def try to write? Oh, okay. Everywhere? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So let's turn to the side changeling world. Please tell us a bit about Alpha Night, your upcoming novel in the Trinity series, which is due out very soon, next month, I think. Um, while Selenka was a character I really wanted to know about, because she seemed to have no trouble standing up to Caleb most of the time, Deep Dark Ethan is a closed book and a new character to get to know. So what's the novel about and how far into the future post-Wolf Rain is it set? Post-Wolf Rain, uh, it's, not, it's not too far from uh, Wolf Rain. I don't like to do huge time jumps because I think with a world that's developing so quickly, uh, the, the big time jumps don't make any sense because we wouldn't lose a lot of information. What is the book about? Well, Selenka is the alpha of the wolf pack, Black Edge, uh, in Moscow. And Ethan is an arrow. And Ethan has, 
you know, all the arrows have dark paths. He is, he is Sai. Um, so he's part of the psychic race. And Ethan has had, you know, a really terrible childhood. He didn't even have the company of his fellow arrows for a long time in his life. So he's very, when we first meet him, he's quite dissociated from the world. Like he sees everything through a wall or a fog and he's just not really there. Um, and he does things to see what will happen because he doesn't have that emotional connection to something. And then this crazy thing happens. It's, it's not a spoiler because it's literally in the back of a blurb. Um, and they, they become mated. And that never happens. Like it, with changelings, you know, mating, there's a mating dance. And then, you know, they find people and they fall in love. And then there's a mating dance and they become mated. Whereas with these two, it's just like, boom. You know, they meet, they made it, and they're like, what is going on? And there's a reason, there's a reason that happens. So it's not just, uh, I can't tell you that because that would be a massive spoiler. But it's about what do you do when you're suddenly mated to the stranger? They're strangers to each other. And, and at the same time, the mating has impacted both of them. So Ethan, the mating doesn't allow the wall between you and the world, you know, especially your mate. And so Ethan is in suddenly like in the world. He is in the world. And, and Selinka, she's alpha. She didn't expect to get mated. And suddenly now she has this psi mate. And he tells her he has secrets. And that might be dangerous to her pack. And so they begin sort of on opposite sides. But what I love about this book is that Ethan is all in. He is all in. He's like, well, you're mated. We're mated now. That means that we belong to each other. You know, he's like, finally, he has someone who belongs to him. And, but their relationship, you know, the development of their relationship, it's, it's amazing. I love it. I, I love how they work together. I love how Ethan sees Selinka as alpha. And he's never, he's never, What's the word? It, like he, he doesn't feel that that's anything he needs to challenge. She is alpha. That is her identity. And he's there to support her. And he, he's not there to, yeah, he's not there to um, push against it. Because to push against that is to push an indelible part of her identity. And, um, and Selenka is totally sort of um, caught off guard by this arrow who keeps worming his way you know, into her heart and she doesn't know quite what's happening. So they're both a little off center um, by what's happened, uh, but they're great characters. And I love the wolves. I loved going back to Black Edge and getting to really know them. And of course the bears have to make an appearance because we're in Moscow and the, the bears are also there. Uh, it's fun. It's a, it's, a, it's a fun book. And I think it has a really warm heart. Can't wait. It's on my Kindle, ready to download the, the, as soon as they release it. <laughs> so Charlotte Ann asks also, are there any other changeling groups that you would like to develop? Oh, sure. There's lots of them. You know, um, there's the, uh, the eagle or the falcons. Um, there was a tiger that was mentioned at one point. I'd love to do the tigers again. Uh, and lynx there's a lynx pack in canada whose alpha um is just comes across as super cute but you know you know she's alpha so there's something more there uh, um, there's always new new characters and groups i want to go to there's the uh leopard pack in south america that uh, mercy's grandmother um heads and you know i'd love to go there as well it's just oh there's so much i could be writing about different picks forever <laughs> Well, I'm sure I speak for all of our readers when I say I hope that's the case. Yeah. <laughs> um, so let's stay with the Psy Changeling series. Our next reader question comes from Danielle Hiller, Hilliard. Do you have the entire Psy Changeling world mapped out with ideas for future books for current side characters? And how many more stories are there in this particular arc? That's my part of the question. Um, I don't, my brain doesn't work like that. So what I generally know is uh, the start of an arc and the end of an arc. So I knew it's left a sensation where I wanted the arc to finish. 
And so when I started the second arc, I know where I want the second arc to finish. And, and then I just let my subconscious go with the flow. So I write one book and then I get to that book and I usually have an idea of where it's going next, like which character will come to the fore. But then I sort of leave it. I leave it for three months or four months, however long while I'm writing my next books. And by the time I sit down to write the next side changeling book again, I know, you know, which character it's, it's going to be. So yeah, that's how it goes. And, and in terms of um, like, I have characters I'd like to write about, but the chemistry has to be there. And it's, it's, as an author, sometimes I think it must sound odd when I say that because I'm the writer, but, as a reader, you can feel chemistry on the page when you open it. You know when characters work and when it's their time. And it's just like that for a writer. Um, I might think, oh, it's time for this person's story. And then I start writing it and no, nothing's happening. And it's actually, it's this completely different person. So I'm always open. I'm always open. I don't know which character is going to come next. I just know where the story is going to progress. And sometimes we have to go on a little tangent. Um, but in the end, it all links back to the main arc and where it's going. Yeah. Sorry, I've got terrible allergies. <laughs> okay, not a problem. If you want to stop, you let me know. Yeah. So let's move on to the Guild Hunter series, which is where I personally started my Nalini Singh fandom. Um, I read it in 2009 when Angel's Blood came out. I actually won an ARC and was hooked from then. Raphael and Elena have had a really rocky ride adventure-wise in the Guild Hunter series, but the heart of the story is their abiding love. How do you keep finding new ways for them to be wonderful and human, even Raphael, after so many books? Um, for me, they're people inside my head. So they have, they're fully fledged characters. They they have likes and dislikes and they have dreams and you know all the whole gamut of what makes us human even though they they aren't human <laughs> anymore but um, because they're people they develop like people if you think of any relationship in your life whether romantic or otherwise it's never the same it's always changing it's always developing dependent on what's happening in your world and um you know, it might not be uh, like they've just fought an archangelic war. It might not be that, but <laughs> um, it's like the current situation in lockdown. You know, that's changed a lot of relationships and had an impact, good or bad. And so I, because I think of my characters the same way as people who are growing and changing, it's very natural to write um to see where they would be now as opposed to where they once were. Um, they're not static. They're not going to stay static. Um, yeah. So I guess that's my, that's how I write them. Just, I follow their life and I try to show how that life reflects in the people they are. So the next in the Guild Hunter series is Archangel Sun. Do you add in November, I think? Yes. I have to admit that when I read the two main characters, my first was, wait, what? Who? So it's like, oh, really? <laughs> but I remember <laughs> a tiny tell back in Archangel's past when the Illuminati had been discovered throwing out the uh, hummingbird's art um, that Titus closed his fists in anger and though he wasn't necessarily the most arty kind of guy. So was that your little hint to us then that many of us wouldn't have picked up? Well, you never know. You'll have to find out when you read the book. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about their story and, and, you know, what can you tell us this far ahead? Oh, what can I tell you? Well, it's a fun book. It, it is a really fun book there. I mean, it's, so the reborn, there's, there's a, the reborn are kind of like zombies in the books and there, there's like a huge infestation of reborn in Africa and Titus needs help to get rid of them because he's you know he's lost a lot of people because he bought battled um Karasemnon and so there's just a lot of devastation and then he's reborn and he needs assistance and then he hears that 
the other archangels have found him help and it's the hummingbird. And he basically says, what am I going to do with her? Because, you know, she's, he's like, oh, she's arty. She's lovely. She's a great artist. And she's off in her own world. You know, I need a warrior. I need someone who can fight these creatures with me. And so he, that's his mindset. And the hummingbird, meanwhile, is, has been asleep in a lot of ways for a long time. And now she's waking. And now she has fully woken in this book. And so Titus finds himself dealing with a very wide awake hummingbird who is the same person she was before and also far different. Because you have to remember, we've only ever seen her as someone who was broken or, you know, in that sort of not quite part of this world. Who is she when she isn't that? And that's the surprise that Titus is about to get. And the other, I mean, I love this book. They're such great characters and they're just, just amazing on the page together. And part of that is because the hummingbird is totally unimpressed by the fact that he's an archangel. Because remember, she has a son with an archangel. Mm. And that archangel was a complete, well, I don't think I could say that word on, you know, on an interview live. <laughs> but he was you know terrible but um so she's like yeah fine you're an archangel like she's not impressed at all and titus is used to everyone being impressed by him you know he's he women love him he loves women he's a lover and he's just not he's not used to this woman saying and basically and she's she's also older you know, she is an older woman <laughs> um, in a world of immortals. It feels funny saying that, but she's had a lot of life that she's lived and she just, she's a fantastic character. And these two together, I, I just had so much fun writing them. And the people who've read the, the draft, you know, it's an edits right now. Um, that's actually the copy edits I have this week. And they've also loved them and loved how those two interacted. And I, I really can't wait for readers to, to meet them together. Thank you. I wonder if, uh, did you ever think about sending Kalyan in to sing the Reborn to Sleep? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I can't give you spoilers about what Kalyan is doing in this book. <laughs> okay. Just, uh, it's funny as a reader when you've read it for like, I think it's 11, 12 years I've been reading this particular So you start to feel like you just want to know everything. Um, so our next two questions come also from Danielle Hilliard. I'll ask the first one. How many more books do you plan to write in the Guild Hunter universe? And then the common catch cry for most of us, when will we have books for Ilium and Aiden? <laughs> I always have known the Guild Hunter series will be shorter than the Side Changing series, just because uh, it's quite tight to a certain cast. But at the same time, I don't want to rush things. So it would be quite easy to write a book about certain characters, but would it be the right book? And that's what I always have in my head. Like, will, is this going to be the right book for these characters? Are they at the point in their life where a story can be told? So what I will say is I won't leave any of the seven hanging when you know when it is time to end the series um, but I can't give you exact timings <laughs> yeah. no thank you for that now this one's for me is it too much to hope that the legion might return to New York in about I don't know 10 books from now <laughs> <laughs> well I, I can't tell you that right now that's all <laughs> I cried buckets when they left let me tell you buckets Oh, it was right. really hard to write as well. You know, I, I love the Legion. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know what's happening there. Like, the story is growing, and then as I write, it sort of reveals itself to me. Even if I know, like I said, if I know the ending, I know the ending of where I want this to end, but the rest of it is a journey of exploration. Oh. Sounds like fun. <laughs> Now, let's chat about your 2021 release, Quiet in Her Bones. It's a standalone novel, yeah? Yes. Yeah. How much can you tell us about that book right now, given there's not even anything on your website? 
Okay, Quiet in a Bones, it's, it's a thriller. So it's another one of my New Zealand set thrillers. And it's about a woman who disappeared 10 years ago, Nina Rai. She was uh, wealthy, uh, a socialite. And everyone thought that she just took off because she got tired of, you know, her husband. Um, and a quarter of a million dollars disappeared with her. So people think, you know, she went off to some beach somewhere living their life. Except now, 10 years later, her bones have been discovered uh, in a forest quite close to where she used to live. And she's wearing the clothes from the night she disappeared. So suddenly, everyone is like, what happened 10 years ago? And basically, who's responsible? Because it becomes clear very soon that it's not an accident. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's nicely creepy. And it's focused on this group that's called that live in the cul-de-sac and it's where she lived. And so it's about finding what secrets, you know, are hiding in that place and who knows something. And yeah, there's some surprises in there. And yeah, it is it's funny talking about a thriller. There's not much you can say without it being a spoiler. Mm. <laughs> Is writing different books and different genres still energising you? Yes, absolutely. I like having not just different books and different genres, but different books and different series as well, because the series are so different. Um, I find it really invigorating. I think right back at the start, when I started the science changing series, I was doing two science changing books a year, and that worked uh, at the time. But these days I find I like having a gap in between so because also when i was doing that i was only writing two books a year so i did have a gap in between that thinking time uh whereas now i'm writing three or four and so if i did the same series it would be right back to back which and i wouldn't have that space for my subconscious to develop ideas and get into characters so yeah i i love it i love having that space to think in between books so even if i'm writing so i'm working on quiet in the bones now but i'm thinking about the next side changing book because that's what i'm going to write next so just just yeah having that space to think leave your writing world but with this last question do you have a favorite novel or a favorite character that you've written who still stands out head and shoulders above the rest for you Oh gosh, no, I get asked this question a lot and the answer is the same. There's no, there's no way to choose because each time I write a book, I'm really into that character's head or if it's multiple characters point of view, I'm in all their heads and they are living at the top of my brain because, and I think that's how it should be. I think I should be passionate about every character I write about because I want readers to feel passionately about these characters. So it's, yeah, it's so hard to choose. Um, I just, I can't, especially because I write such different characters. So, mm, yeah, no. <laughs> Have any of your characters been inspired by people you know? In terms of uh, like actual character personality, no. I did use um, my sister's name for Ashwini, you know, the guilt hunter. And that was quite funny because she was sitting next to me and we were discussing something. I can't remember. And she said, you know, I've never read a character that has my name in a book. <laughs> and I thought, aha. <laughs> so I wrote this novella and I used her name as a surprise. And, um, and then the character just grew and she got her whole full book. But the character isn't Ashwini, my sister. She is a totally different person, but the name, I use the name, yeah. <laughs> okay, our last question um, is, what have you missed most during lockdown? Um, and congratulations on um, Ms Ardern's containment of the, the coronavirus <laughs> over there. But at least we might be able to travel to each other now. So what yes, the doing? bubble, the trans-tasmal, yeah. What have, what have missed? I missed the most? It's um, when we were in full lockdown, so level one, 
I missed being able to see all the people I normally would. I think that was the biggest thing for me, just not being able to drop by, for example, and see my mum and dad or not being able to um, see my sister or meet up with my writing group and, or catch up for a coffee with friends. You know, just these things we take for granted, these little bits of contact. And I think that for me was the biggest, just uh, not having the ability to just hop in my car and, you know, drop by for lunch. <laughs> you bring someone up and say, hey, I'm coming over. So I think for me, that was that was the biggest. Um, yeah. What will be the first major thing you do when the restrictions are fully eased? Oh, what will I do? Major. Okay, if we're thinking major, I'll probably go somewhere, like a little trip, probably inside New Zealand, um, because it's beautiful country and there's lots I haven't seen yet. So, yeah, I think I would do a trip somewhere. I have to agree with you on New Zealand. I've been there a couple of times. It's just a beautiful country. It is, isn't it? So, Lenny, that brings us to the end of our time together today. Um, and before I wrap up, can I get you to hold up your... Uh, Oh, yes, your, your, sheet, your treasure hunter sheet, please. That's right. Here we go. Can you guys see it? A bit closer for me. Up, oh, back a bit. That's it. 43069472 is the number. Thank you, Nalini. You're welcome. But don't forget that you can connect with Nalini at nalinisingh.com. And it's another one of those websites where there are lots of small treasures for readers, like deleted scenes, short stories, and other interesting things. You can also connect with Nalini on Facebook and Twitter. Nalini, thank you so much for your time today. It's great to see you again, and I know our readers will appreciate hearing from you. It was great to be here and talking to you. Take care.